Hi, and thanks for downloading the Lean Into Artcast, the show where a couple of visual storytellers get together, engage with different visual storytelling topics, making things, planning to make things, living with a lifestyle in making things. Uh, we think hard about this visual storytelling stuff, so you will too. My name is Jersey Drozd. I'm a cartoonist and a teaching artist. The other host is... Hey, I am Rob Stenzinger. I am a user experience and game designer. So comic book artist, teachers, game designers, coders, mm -hmm. and design. Well, no, we said game designers and coders. Yeah. Interesting always, bag of people. Yeah. What a what a what a bunch of titles there. <laughs> we sure do have a lot of titles, Rob. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know. Um. um but you know what? To this week, we're going to focus more on the, the teaching and advocacy part, right? Mm. Because uh, if I may build the case for this, which if you haven't seen it in the YouTube description or in the episode description. Mm -hmm. uh, okay. In making stuff, in some, way, in some way or another, you are going to be called upon to share how that happened, whether it's being interviewed on a podcast, like you're trying to promote your work and you go on a show and somebody starts asking you questions about how you make this thing, right? Interviewed on TV or whatever, or employee meeting, you know, company meeting, and like you're invited to present to talk about this project that you developed with your team and the organization. Um, or maybe you are actually leading like a, a, a visit at like a university or a school or a library. Um, in any case, at some point or another, or maybe maybe just at a party. Maybe you're at a party with a bunch of people, and they say, like, oh, what do you do? And you, start, you say the title, and they go, oh, nice. What does that mean? Right? Well, you could begin to go into the nitty-gritty, or, you know, how do you think about unpacking your work so that you can communicate that in a way that is understandable to somebody who's never done it? Um, how, what, 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 do you remember, ever heard that metaphor of, like, the... the Trying to explain the, the frog, trying to explain to the tadpole what air is like. <laughs> That's very folksy. I like it. <laughs> uh, <laughs> Rob, never tell you, but them Duke boys. Uh, <laughs> Holy, is it um, okay? So in that case, the um, in some ways you're trying to relate it with two very different perspectives, right? The frog and the and the tadpole. But I mean, or if you have maybe you're just meeting a frog that's in a different swamp, right? Right. And, uh, you know, my swamp has a tire, you know, this, what's a tire, right? Yeah. It's, uh, and, or, or the other, the other example I've heard is like trying to explain the sensation of skiing to somebody who's never done it. Right. Like there's this, sure. there's going to be some language barriers there and there's going to be like, at least in my experience, there's been language barriers based out of familiarity and jargon that comes with being deeply involved in something. Right. So powerful that jargon signals to other advanced practitioners that, Hey, we're, we're deep into this thing. Right. And now we can go into the, you know, mind meld or whatever, whatever happens when you're the, the deep practitioner of a thing. Right. Right. But, um, but it can totally be off putting to someone who's fresh. Right. Right. I remember when I was hanging out with some designers and we were talking about file formats, right. And it's like, we're talking about the difference between Ping and TIFF and, and, uh, JPEG and, and GIF or GIF, whatever you want to call it. Oh no! I was waiting for the the GIF GIF to come up. I, I'm 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 ambivalent on that. I know people get really fired up about it, but there's so many things I don't get that fired up about anymore, <laughs> and that's one of them. Uh, but like I remember being in mixed company, and I looked over and I watched the person kind of glazing over, and they're like, I just heard a whole bunch of acronyms, and I don't know what any of those things mean, you know. And and I don't care. I don't care, and I don't understand why you guys are so fired up about this. Right. Mm. <laughs> so uh, that can be that can be something that divides people. It can be it can be a unifying force for people, who, like you said, a signal of, of expertise. But it can also be something that makes the, the, just uh, not that everybody has to always be included. But I like to I that's my bias. Let me start out by stating my bias. My bias is that I want as many of my interactions as possible to leave somebody with a clear on ramp to approach the stuff that I think about in a meaningful and useful way. Their choice to do it. They don't have to. But I don't want to advertently or inadvertently prevent that on-ramp from appearing, right? I try to be cautious mm. about that. Well, and so what's what's the side effect of saying that, well, as I, as you're going about sharing 
uh, what you do and right sizing it and trying to match it up to the to the audience where it's like, oh, this is a quick introduction or this is an interview on a podcast or, oh, this is a talk or something larger, right? Each one of those, I imagine, has a different approach. But um, what, um, let's see, I guess, how do you, it, it, is that where you're getting at? Where, yeah. okay. Yeah, I think that's what, why don't we start with the first half of the show. We talk about like on the ground, how we think about approaching different audiences in different situations and like what are the concerns that we you know are sort of sort of our workflow for putting together these kinds of unpacking scenarios um figure out reverse engineering what we do to make it translatable to any audience and then the second half we can maybe talk about you know some of the questions and the the rationale why we make those choices I think it's awesome, and I'm, and I, I'm really curious to circle back to the the uh, the on ramp thing, because there's there there must be that sort of matchmaking that that that's happening where it's like, you know, um, well, gosh, what was that 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 um, oh that movie with the aliens from the '90s with the uh, uh, Would you like to know more? Uh, the oh, it was um, Starship Troopers. Oh, right? I still haven't all, seen that. Oh wait, no, I oh have. I have seen that. Yes. That's that. That's that really gory one. <laughs> it's really gory, but yeah. like, there's some ambient things that that convey the, um, I don't know, quirky aspects of that world. Like, uh, like there are interactive posters and stuff, and uh, okay. and and it was like you could you could block by it and be like, okay, I've I've got enough, but you could actually stare at it and it would tell you more. Ah, uh, yeah, yeah. I I feel like I'm constantly leaving that invitation wide open. Would you like to know more? I'm ready to. <laughs> I'm ready to hold up the line. <laughs> <laughs> There's other people that need this room, but you know what? You asked, so here we go. You know, perfect. Uh, okay, well then, how about I hit the music and we make our transition over to uh, on the ground? Ready? Mm -hmm. Here we go. Boom. Up. Oh. <laughs> okay. Here we go. Boom. <laughs> All right, yes, the intense music, because it's, it's intense being on the ground, because this is where you're actually uh, trying not to uh, get overwhelmed in the stuff and actually make all those individual tactical choices instead of strategic choices. Um, where do you want to start? What kind of uh, events, presentations, communication scenarios do you want to explore? Well, okay, so let's say that, uh, well... This isn't a long walk or to, we can go very specific with a scenario where, where you've been invited to share a bit about what you do somewhere, right? Okay. Like you're and, doing a talk. Uh, yeah. You're doing, well, okay, wait a minute. It can take different about? forms. Like I yeah. suppose we should name the form. Yeah. And, uh, but the, but the idea is, is that, well, as a matter of you going about your creative pursuits and um, professional trade, you've been recognized as someone who, uh, might have interesting things to share on like, well, making comics or it could be in particular about some aspect of making comics like, you know, characters or designing for um, particular well, youth just... audiences or like name one of these that you've been pulled, you know, recruited okay, yeah. to do. Let's make this distinction real quick. One, we're talking about specifically where you are invited to sort of have the chair rather than be mm -hmm. interviewed, right? So... There's, there's being interviewed, and that could be on like a panel discussion or at a conference or on a podcast, being interviewed by somebody where they're kind of directing the line of questioning. And you can only do so much prep for that. But this will be scenarios where you are specifically invited to, you get the podium, we're giving you an hour, we're here to, to get something from you, right? Mm -hmm. um, the way, and, and when you, you sort of kind of hit exactly what one of my first points would have been is... Uh, if I was invited to go talk to someplace about comics, comics is such a huge topic. Any any medium, like if you say video games, huge topic. Or are you talking about console games? You're talking about mobile games. You're talking about puzzle games. You're talking about adventure games. You're talking about horror games. You're talking about right. Mm -hmm. uh, are you talking about games that are that are, are designed to help you learn something like Brain Age or something like that? Or are you talking about something that's like meant to be like a wide open fantasy? Are you talking about the actual like character generation <laughs> aspect? <laughs> totally, right. big teams, small teams, all that. Yeah. Yeah, you go in lots and, and lots. Uh, and, and you can easily drown under all of that. So uh, a way I like to think about it when I'm approached to do this is I'll try to pick what's one thing or one activity. Like I really like to, 
my favorite scenario is when people are actually like engaging with it with their hands in some way. But even if they're not, I'll pick like one concept or one like maybe one or two and really focus all my attention around that. Right. So what are you talking about? Like in my mm. particular example, like, yeah, character design. I might do a whole hour about like character design or um, moment choice, composition, um, or even like the collaborative aspects. Like what happens when you put your voice with somebody else's voice? What does it look like when it's happening? And why would you even do it? You know, um, but the important thing to me is, is like it, it creates a like a clear goal for me but uh but also um it gives me a starting point knowing that i'm going to hit every other aspect in some way or another when you talk about character design you could wind up talking about collaboration you could wind up talking about moment choice and character design i designed this character to be this in this way and that affected the moment choices because well they uh, don't bend at the waist very well, and so when I wanted to show like like very specific emotions, I had to find creative ways to do that because I couldn't just use pure body language, right? Mm. Th that kind of thing. Okay. Um, you can wind up hitting all the other layers of the thing through the pinhole of the specific item that you're exploring, right? Which makes it manageable for you, and it also makes it manageable for an audience because if you try to blast them with all of your years of experience when they haven't thought they haven't engaged with it the way you have um you can find yourself and them in the weeds also it's uh it's the whole idea of like if you've ever tried to learn something and you don't know where to begin right like if you, if, you, if i were to say um i want to learn auto engine repair um where do i start you know i don't know the first mm -hmm. thing about them i know that oil goes in one place and the windshield wiper fluid goes in another place but really like what's the how does the mechanics even work of it? And like, why are this part there? And why is it not over there? Right. Um, to build on your, your metaphor though. Like, so yeah. this isn't the case where then you've, in, you've invited essentially a, um, a recognized skilled mechanic to come, yeah. to come give a talk about some aspect of, um, engine repair, maintenance, what have you. And you know why drive shafts are so amazing because they were developed at this and this time, and, the, and because of the drive shaft, this can happen now. Well, you haven't heard about this part? Well, let's drill down on that because it relates to the drive shaft. And so now suddenly I've got like at least the beginning of a path to follow on this thing, right? Um, yeah. yeah from the, the approachable presentation in some kind of inviting way on a topic, um, that, that'll hook me actually no matter what. Now I'm actually curious about the approachable mechanic show <laughs> where I didn't <laughs> expect sure. to be. Anybody who's watching this on YouTube right now, I bet if you just go in the search bar and find the approachable mechanic show, I'm sure you will find something. I bet. Um, um, so, okay. You've, you, you've described some of the qualities of like what you would do, but like what, um, uh, gosh, I'm, I have urges to go like in, into why questions or whatnot. Maybe, maybe I need to hold off on this and, and, uh, and hear out hold, like, hold them in your why bag, Rob. <laughs> I know, but put, put it away. Because <laughs> now is not the time. We're on the ground. We've got our boots on, right? So, all right. What, um, like, what, what does this look like as far as you know, why does this seem approachable? Like the 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 talk that you're presenting versus something else. Like, like, how am I hooked when I am picking which which track or thing to attend? Right. Right. So, okay. So this is another thing that I've and this is maybe born out of my personal bias. It's something I noticed at any rate. Whenever I wanted to learn something quickly, um, and like, and I, I'm thinking specifically, I think the example I, I've used in before is when my sink broke and I was trying to fix it myself. And again, I think I've established that I'm not much of a handy person, um, but I'm trying to figure out how to fix this sink. And so I'm on YouTube looking up videos, looking for you know the approachable sink mechanic show. <laughs> and there's a lot of these videos started with, them exploring what clearly were the fundamentals, uh, but like they would spend five minutes going, this is a crescent wrench, this is a socket wrench, this is a, you know, a vice grip, this is, it's a, they, they, explaining every, each and every tool, and they're slowly and patiently lining them all up, and these are the tools that you should have to get started, you know? Meanwhile, I've got water spraying in my kitchen, right? I'm like, well, what do I do? What do I do? You know, so I'm like trying to scrub ahead to get to the part where he's actually addressing the specific part that I brought. So, for me, uh, I learned very quickly, like, I need to see the person do the thing first. That's the kind of learner I guess I am, where I have to watch them do it, 
And then I start to make some inferences as to, as to how they did it. And then when they're explaining to me, I'm connecting between what I inferred and what really happened. So when I'm doing any kind of presentation, even if it's not something where somebody's going to like specifically draw, even if it's not one where it's like a workshop, even if it's a talk, something I like to do is, you know, we've talked about this off mic, is uh, the magic trick part where you put into action the principle that you're going to explore. And so something I do with my young students and even with adult students when I teach an adult class is I start with a blank sheet of paper and I just solicit ideas from the crowd. I'm like, okay, we've got, you know, um, shark, truck driver, uh, grumpy attitude, um, let's go. And I start putting the idea together and I talk through it while I'm going, right? Oh, and I specifically use language where I say like, I'm gonna hand over my drawing hand to your brains. Your brain's going to feed my drawing hand the ideas to make this thing happen. And then I'm, as I'm drawing the character, I'm, I'm sort of walking through my thinking. Like, well, maybe they need like a tattoo. And well, maybe we'll make it like a, a snub nose rig. Or maybe we'll make it this kind of rig. Uh, maybe we'll make the, the, the truck driver uh, a really sassy lady. That will be kind of cool. Let's, let's explore what it looks like when you make a sassy lady shark truck driver, that kind of thing. Um, and it's entertaining. But also, even when I'm doing it sloppily, there's a fluency that's happening there that the audience doesn't necessarily have. So it looks like magic. I know I was I was visiting a student uh, at her house doing like some tutoring kind of thing. And as I showed up, she was finishing up harp lessons. Right. You ever watch somebody play a harp? Uh, I don't think I have. It, it looks like magic because there's no there's no like there's no stickers or symbols to indicate where your fingers go. There's just like a whole mess of strings. And I'm watching this kid effortlessly just put her fingers where they need to be on the strings and beautiful music is happening. Right. And I'm watching this and I'm like, wow. you know, it's, it's astonishing to see something like that happen to watching fluency when you have very little interaction with something really feels magical. Right. So and that's why I think about this, like this performance aspect is like, uh, watch how effortlessly this happens. It's fun to watch somebody do something fairly well. And then I turn to them and I was like, and if it's a workshop especially, I say, now you're going to do the exact same thing. We had nothing here. It was just a blank sheet of paper. There was no ideas. Now we have the beginnings of a workable character that we can start telling stories about. We can make guesses about what, how this character feels, what their worldview is, who they might care about, who might not like them, who might love them. Right? We can make a lot of guesses now because we've got the beginnings of something and you fed those ideas into this. I've proven that you can do it. Now you're going to do it, right? Um, yeah, it's it's uh, it's and it's also setting like a playful tone, right? We're going to engage with this thing, um, and it's going to be fun for you. This isn't going to be. I'm not going to tell the tell the room to simmer down because we got work to do. But like, let's have a good time with this thing. Okay, this is. Um, there are so many things compressed in what you've shared so far sorry <laughs> no it <laughs> don't be this is i mean in a way like you're uh, i mean you're performing and modeling in a way that i've seen you do many times as you're as you're as you're teaching a class or or providing a workshop and or giving a talk and there's this um can i can i put a lampshade on a few different things please okay so there's um oh, let's see you, you start out with the whole, uh, well, setting up this whole thing as a, as a, a structured activity that has a, a lot of intention, right? And that this seems to, okay, we can dig into why and whatnot later, but, but then there's the whole, like, during the event, then you're, you're sort of hooking and inviting people to, to come along with you. And it's, and it seems to be based on a few different principles of like participation. It's not just me, it's us, right? You kind of mm. create a lot of, um, th ways to get involved and making it safe and, and okay to be involved. And some of that is like, you're being very transparent as you go. Like you're really sharing your thoughts as you're performing. And that's that it really helps with involvement and understanding what's going on. And then you have this um, repeated invitation and, um, but it's not the same invitation. Like, um, you don't say, would you like to know more like a hundred times a minute? Right. <laughs> I mean, you're saying, um, you, you know, yeah. <laughs> come along, this is fun. And you're demonstrating that, it, that, and, and, uh, giving credit and positive, uh, positive feedback where this is, it's desirable to like, come along with you on this, um, on this pretty safe experiment. And That's... I find that I, I find that that tone is a lot more comfortable for all involved than being self-deprecating, 
right? Like it, it, I make self-deprecating jokes during my presentations all the time. But if I'm up there saying, uh, yeah, I really don't know what I'm doing. I'm kind of faking my way through this. And geez, I don't even know why I'm up here sometimes, you know, like that kind of humor. I feel like it, it reminds me of uh, something that I heard, you know, cartoonists say like 20 years ago about por portfolio reviews. And you go into a portfolio review. I'm like, well, this is my best stuff, but here it is. And to which the portfolio reviewer is going to say, well, show me your best stuff, right? Um, people show up and they want you to be fluent and successful at what you're doing because they're, they're spending their time with you, you know? Um, and if, if I make fun of myself and diminish my own uh, abilities in order to not be Mr. Big Shot up there saying, hey, everybody, I'm a master and watch this, um, I think has a, a, also a negative effect. I mean, having done that before, that's true but okay so wait a minute so in a way being self-deprecating with a little bit of humor can be really inviting and mm -hmm. can show that it's safe to interact with you because you're not the authority who's going to say and um and i tricked you into making the proof that you suck <laughs> yeah. Yeah. you know yeah <laughs> and uh so you're not going to do that and so how does that work because like, because in, in my experience People show up to things, at least I show up to things. If I'm going to talk, I want them to be really awesome and really experienced and really passionate. But I, I really, I want there to be like a fluency and expertise that I can learn from, right? Mm -hmm. I'm there because I want to level up too. Um, and while I don't want them to say like, sorry, son, some people got it, other people don't, you don't got it. I don't want necessarily that experience with them. Uh, but I find that the ones who are like, boy, this is awesome. Yeah, maybe maybe I'm I've got a lot of experience with this and I've been thinking about it for a long time, but I really like for you to be join in with me, right? The only thing different differentiates me and you is like a few years of experience on this, right? Um, mm -hmm. it, it it almost it removes that hierarchical uh, model altogether. There is no hierarchy. There's just somebody who's been here a little bit longer and they have a little bit more to share because of it. So we're all still students. Is we're like all another still students. Yeah. one of the values you're demonstrating. Yeah. Yeah, and so and 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 I and for me at least, language that I think is really important to me is, um, we did this right. I handed over my drawing hand to your brain. Yes, I did the drawing. Yes, I put the ideas together, but it was a co collaborative experience, and and I really want to underline that verbally to the audience. And then another thing I'd throw in from my experience in working with students and working with people in presentations is, um, you remember the Simpsons episode where the animator comes to school with his com his cartoon called uh, Danger Dog? No. Uh, it's it's a pretty funny episode. It's it's the one when Bart Simpson makes his own comic called Angry Dad. Uh, he's inspired by this cartoonist, and, and he winds up making internet cartoons about Angry Dad with this internet startup <laughs> that goes belly up because it was, it was the cartoon was made in the year 2000. Um, but in that, it, like, after the, the animator comes to the school and does a presentation, it cuts to Bart Simpson's classroom, and all the kids are making comic books and like i'm making my own original character called danger cat <laughs> like i'm making uh, trouble dude you know like they're they're all just <laughs> aping what they just saw which is what you do when you're a kid right because mm -hmm. they what the animator did in that situation is he provided sort of like a target for them to try to hit and when you don't have a ton of experience with the medium or the craft you just hit those surface features first and foremost so me doing that little demonstration at the beginning also gives the people who really have no idea on where to start, I gave you a target. And there's always a small percentage of the room that does exactly what I did. Well, I made a, a shark truck driver, you know. Um, that's terrific. What'd you do? Let's see. Explain your choices to me, right? That kind of thing. Um, which, again, provides an on-ramp for somebody who might not have had that before, right? And so what if it's aping what I did? It gets them started. Well, I mean, it's no longer alien at the very least. And now, yeah, that's something that is truly um, where you have no fluency. Uh, it, it's, it's scary to, to even try, to even pick it up. Um, where even if you have a little bit of like side door or back door or some sort of fluency, like um, like I don't think I could play a harp, but I'd, I wouldn't be afraid to try it because, you know, I've, I've played around with, with instruments a, a fair amount. Um, but I think I would be pretty res reluctant to like, you know, operate like, um, 
like construction equipment or <laughs> yeah um, <laughs> Or or go ice skating, right? Like I, I know oh. I've told you stories about me like having really bad experiences on ice ice skates because it's like <laughs> I'm this very tall, you know, not not insubstantial man, mm-hmm. and there's a bunch of people around me. If I go down, <laughs> there's consequences, right? Um, a lot of physics going on. Um, <laughs> so, but okay. So what if? But you could see that it's possible if someone was providing. Um, you had a great the, the approachable mechanic ice skating teacher. Mm-hmm. Um, this may be a different story. Yeah, yeah. Uh, and I would also say, like, I think this is a, this is an anxiety that we we all experience. I think on a pretty regular basis, but we probably don't notice it as much. Like, for instance, when I talk to other cartoonists about like even little dumb things, like uh, they ask me, "Oh, what are you drawing?" And I'm like, "Oh, I'm using Clip Studio Paint." Oh, I could never walk away from Photoshop. I, I've been with it my whole life. And the thought of having to learn a new software, oh, who's got that? Right? It's the same kind of thing. Oh, yeah. And to which I go like, well, actually, it's really similar. Like, no, nope, no, nope, no. Nope. I don't even want to hear it because I've got my thing and it's comfortable, right? So, yes. um, And then that, it's not to diminish anybody. Uh, that's actually, I think it's a, just a very human thing. We get into our comfort zones. Um, and it's, I think, especially as we get a little bit older, too. So I'm I'm actually like when I'm teaching adults I'm like three times as gentle as when I teach kids because like kids it's like a, here's a pencil <laughs> like oh here's forty five drawings what's next you know um so yeah so then like the the last thing I bake into if I'm doing any kind of like thing where I've got the podium and if I, if there is room for me to invite the audience to do some kind of drawing activity I try to come up with some kind of like discrete thing that they can do like i said i do the demo and i say now you're going to do that and try to do something that with the time allotted where they can walk out with something finished right even if it's like a a pencil drawing of a character design uh something that completes the cycle for them they started with nothing and they walked out with something that is the beginning of a finished thing so that they close the loop on the creative process and they have evidence that they can interact with it even if they don't do anything else with it because Going and listening to something is pretty cool. Uh, learning and, and absorbing at your own rate is pretty cool. Going and having interacted with it and walking out going like, hey, I kind of did a thing today, uh, at least in my experience, is like double positive, right? Like it really reinforces it. Well, I mean, and have you seen um, like, what are uh, like what are some differences from from what you've exp- what you've experienced i mean was there have have you always had this by these set of uh principles and techniques and stuff and like I, I i'm just wondering like what it looks like without some of that at the at the end right yeah so, so at the end like i've done like just a, a straight up talk with the slides the slide deck and maybe some q a at the end kind of thing mm. and that ends with few people come up thanks a lot i really got a lot out of that follow-up question what do you think about this um do you remember this particular thing and and then thanks again and they go about their business and and if there's any epiphanies that happen i'm not present for it right like those are the experiences where i'm really counting on whatever impact it makes it's probably not going to reveal itself for a long time to come and i may never get that uh feedback loop for myself and i'm fine with that um but when you have people interact with a thing and try it for themselves, especially when you see that they're a little bit nervous about doing it and doing it wrong, you know, and then when I get to come around like, oh, this just happened in my classroom, this little girl, she loves to draw, but she's never made comics. And so she's, she's working on her characters and I'm like, okay, well, tell me, walk me through what you got there. And she's like, oh, well, this is a really uh, nice taco who... <laughs> because he took a really bad elixir sometimes turns into a really evil burrito and it caught me so off guard that i just i burst into laughter like real genuine laughter like like why where is this coming from this sweet little kid who's got like this nice taco turns to me why why would a burrito be evil versus a nice taco you're showing us some biases here (laughs) and so like as, as i'm reacting to it i'm watching this kid get that validation of like whoa professional grown up really likes my idea right and I watch that kid suddenly work with a renewed zeal because you want that reaction again, right? You want to make people laugh. Everybody wants to make people laugh. Everybody wants to get a positive reaction from an audience. Um, and But also it's like this clear signal that what you're doing, what you're making is good and meaningful to somebody, right? And I think that that's, that's a feedback loop that you don't get when you attend something and just listen and absorb, 
right? It's not, I don't think there's one more valuable than the other. I, let me make that clear. I think that they both have their own value and meaning, but one has a much more present and immediate kind of feedback to it. Totally. I, I, I agree because in, even in a, in a talk that's not technically an interactive learning experience, I really do like to have some kind of um, participatory thing Right. So how many of you feel this way? How many of you feel that way? And, and, uh, well, someone, you know, first person to shout out a situation, let's noodle on this. Like, uh, what's like first time you notice a really bad user interface, like, okay, pick that. All right. What is this? And now, okay. So it's a combination of like something comes out of the crowd. This is a, this event is unique to right here and now, no matter what's in a slide deck. It's yeah. something that we created. Um, yeah, I was once present together. at a talk where the presenter said, please don't video record this because this I've worked really hard on this presentation and I travel around the country with it and I really count on its value. You know, To which I get that. But then like the second question I had was like, but why wouldn't you change it up for every place you go? <laughs> like that's yeah. what I would want to do, right? I would want it to be like fresh and unique every time and have like, and there's going to be moments where maybe it bombs a little bit, but there's also going to be parts where it's like, this was, this was yours. This experience was all just you and me in this room together. And it, ex yes, exactly. I mean, totally my bias. And I, I can understand how, I mean, some, yeah, if you've crafted just this incredibly perfectly woven thing in the series of moments, it's like, it's almost like you're putting on a play instead yeah. of um, even, even sort of the, the, the dialogue style talk with some kind of audience participation. You, all you want is essentially audience reaction, different motivation, I think different, different, um, work product to, to share. Right. Um, interesting. But then I wonder if you could go yeah. into like, um, what does a modeling activity look like for one of your events? Let's see. So a modeling activity, uh, well, let's see what would modeling activity looks like. A lot of times I, I like to demonstrate that. Um, so working in a corporate environment, getting people of different sort of um, pay grades and ranks and all this stuff to work together in a, in a flat collaborative fashion is a lot of times my goal. And so then I, I seek to um, do some kind of warm, warm up activity that is all about um, getting getting small groups of people to work together in ways that they may not normally so and uh some of that can be um just explicitly saying like okay i'm so glad everyone's here and it's it's an honor based on where all the things that everyone has achieved and all of your titles fantastic you're amazing people and those are are, are at the door like we leave their leave our titles at the door and now we're just people here we are happen to know different things and now we're going to try to find ways to weave them together. So you and have like a, a, a front ended ritual to sort of set their depending mindsets. on the group. So I'll either front end a, um, a warm up activity with that kind of speech, a little tiny, you know, concept set of principles to share, or I'll do it right, right after. So, so it's like somewhere it's, it's either beginning or after a, a warm up. And so a common warm up I'll do is that, okay, we're all divided in groups of five and, or, or so. And you'll notice that your table has a few different markers. We're going to take turns working on the, these, these different whiteboards that are distributed, right? And you all have a shape already there, right? Or I've got a few different ways where I facilitate this, but let's say you've got a shape on the whiteboard. I need you to turn that into a, um, turn that into a creature, but I'm going to give you a name for each of your creatures is going to have a name and then use that to turn that into something. And then then we'll do that and you know everyone will share and we'll react and then the next round oh guess what now we have to iterate on this creature so this creature has a problem this you know like and then now i have a deck of problems here's a, here's a problem here and everyone gets a problem right you know i can't this one can't find the remote control this one needs a comfy chair this one needs whatever so now your job is to design a thing based on that problem the creature has around the creature. So take your, you know, take your whatever and um, your, your um, whiteboard marker and doodle around this thing. And so you do these rounds. And so like the, what this is about is how we can work together to be creative and achieve interesting outcomes and um, 
probably in ways that we didn't expect when we when we started so that's what that that's a you know that's a uh sort of a model in a building a ship building a ship in a bottle kind of modeling where it's like i'm creating the experience and facilitating to help people ex, you know firsthand connect with these ideas mm -hmm. and then i hang a lampshade on it with those principles and also i i heard a lot of chunking in there you're like creating very specific discrete activities so as not to be like mm -hmm. you know um write me a story well what's what, what, <laughs> what kind of story I don't know, write something, you know. Um, yep. You're saying, like, this is the specific action you're going to take. Because like, this is another thing that I think I learned through years and years of doing it. I didn't think this way when I started, but that, like, a tiny discrete activity actually has, like, 50 layers inside of that, right? It does. Like, like how will you get up and commit and actually just go through that creative exercise that you probably didn't feel like doing when you showed up, right? But yeah. but here you are, and, and now you're getting roped in and, 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 um, taking part. One other thing that that it's a modeling exercise, it's a bit meta and that's kind of my style where if you're doing something based on empathy for someone else, it's not just your own ideas and biases. It's modeling, um, being intentional about helping someone else to, you know, solve a problem. Mm. So that's part of that whole, it's, it's my doodle creatures exercise. Um, which I think we've modeled on the show in the past. Yeah. Which we, I think we have. Yeah. Yeah. But that's got a couple layers to it. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, that, that is one of the nicer aspects when you can build lesson plans that, uh, like the, the one I, I'm thinking of is great big giant awesome comic where it's, it's really, it feels like it's this giant party and the kids are all climbing on the tables, but it's really it, like, there's like very, very specific rules about engaging with each other's work. And you have to you have to agree on how your stories converge on this great big giant comic. And oh, that's a cool one. Yeah, you don't get to say no. You have to say yes and. You have to build on each other's ideas. And if you don't agree on something, if you feel like th this isn't this isn't happening, then the other kids are invited to join into the discussion and offer solutions. Um, and when things get like, so I have a ritual that I do as well with my students, and I don't do this with grown ups. I've done it with kids and teens, and it's worked. But I've never tried it with grown ups. Uh, but when I notice that things get a little rambunctious, I will stop them. And I don't do this at the top of every class. I'll wait for like the, the, the culture to give me the signal. Like the culture's not where I want it to be or where I feel feel like it's in a healthy place. Uh, I have the kids all gather in a circle and I sit down, you know, crisscross applesauce on the floor. They all do too. And I speak in this very low tone, which is like if you've been in my classroom, like that's like, whoa, whoa, what just happened? Why is everything else? In, why is he quiet? Right? Like, is somebody in trouble? Um, and so and then I say like, all right, well, you know, when you entered this room, you, you you elected to join a tribe. And let me explain what the rules of being in this tribe are. Right? And then I tell, you know, like we, we support one another, we help one another, we, we contribute to each other's ideas, we offer ideas freely, and if somebody wants to build on an idea, we let them run with it, and then they in turn will let us run with their ideas. Uh, this is all about creating together, and this is all about expressing ourselves through comics. Um, and if, if you can't, if, if you find that this is too difficult to abide by, there's the door, you know, and, and I look at every, each, every kid in the eye, I'm like, everybody, is everybody cool with that? Does everybody want to be part of this? You know? And then they nod and they say, all right, well, you know, I clap my hands before, bam, okay, we're, we're a tribe now, you know? And that like has like really <laughs> powerful effect on the kids. Cause then I hear them using that language later on in the term where they're saying like, you know, people in our tribe don't talk like that, that kind of thing. Mm. Um, so so that that's a really that's a great way to share those tools it, it, and it becomes, uh, make it more it, tangible it sounds like yeah well it makes it explicit that like this is yeah. this is the the way we're going to interact with the medium here um because especially when you start getting to like 13 14 year olds um some, some unhealthy competition happens you know like i encourage competition but in the spirit of play not in the spirit of domination um mm. Can we talk very, very briefly about the other situation where you don't have the podium and you're being interviewed? Oh, sure. Yeah, that's a, that's a very different situation because, I mean, I don't know if we'll be able to touch on all of it. That you've got the no. situation where you're being interviewed. You have the situation where you're the, the moderator, right? And that's mm -hmm. like a whole different level. So maybe, maybe that could be a separate uh, thing we revisit in a different uh, episode. But Yeah, yeah. So, so if you're being interviewed, like how much... Um, I mean, really, what does prep look like? Well, 
something that I find very attractive, again, we're talking about my bias here. Um, I think both of us probably are on the same page when it comes to this, is like being very explicit about your choices and how you arrived where you got. And some of this stuff is unpacking and asking yourself questions long after the fact. But um, having personal stories to share of how, how did you arrive at the conclusion that you're discussing, right? If somebody asks you something about the work, some specific element of the work, and if you have a personal story that you can relate to, how you got to where you are to be able to do that specific thing. Why that topic? Why that kind of creature? Why that kind of character? Why this kind of format? Why black and white? Why color? If there's any kind of personal story that led you to making those decisions, I think that's really interesting to people. And again, it helps people on ramp to it because then it's not um, this work of absolute genius that just descended and you just accepted it and you put it on the page. But like, there's like a million life experiences that lead you to creating the work that you create. Um, or even like a, a tool. Why why a brush and not a, a pen? Why a ballpoint and not a pencil? Why pencil and not that? And having like a real reason for explaining that. And, and, and I think this can work its way into workshops. This can work its way into presentations. But I think especially when you're being interviewed, having that information at the ready. So when somebody says like, you know, I noticed like, for instance, something you brought up, Rob, you said uh, that you noticed in my work, I do this thing where I do these inset triangles in my comics pages where I'll have like a big panel some, some kind of action happening in it, and then I'll have these two breakout triangles pointing to two of the characters where they're reacting to what happened in the panel before, right? Mm -hmm. And I had thoughts on that. Like, why, why would I do that? And why not just have them be two square panels? Why have them be triangles? Well, it's come because of things like Robotech that I grew up with where I noticed that was happening in the show, but also I noticed that it creates a sense of simultaneity or at least like a more immediate kind of moment-to-moment -moment transition rather than having like a gutter between the panels, right? Suddenly you've mm -hmm. got something to talk about rather than like, you know, I don't know. It's kind of weird. I just do it, right? And yeah, maybe the first time you get asked, you say, I don't know. But then whenever I catch myself saying I don't know is usually when I feel like time to follow up. Time to follow up and ask myself some really serious investigation as to why I am doing that. Well, I mean, and there's techniques, like even if you're caught flat-footed, so because it's not like you can you can prepare for ever, any possible question you'll ever be asked, right? Sure. Uh, even if it's through work that you've already presented on and all that, I mean, there's, there's always some new perspective or, or angle. So what, um, I, part of what I'm, what I'm hearing you, you, there's gotta be a set of tools there, right? Where, okay, I actually hadn't considered that. And now I recognize I hadn't considered that. It's like, well, so you're asking me about a tool. Why did I choose that tool? What problem was I trying to solve? Was there a problem? Was there not? Was it ergonomic? And does it? Have, what did it relate to me? Did it relate to um, production process? Did it relate to time? Did it relate to money? Did it relate you know, like something? Yeah, like, yeah. Pick pick some resource, and you know, you can probably self-interview your way into um, some greater understanding. Besides, I don't know. Well, and 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 the funny thing is, all those different roads that you that you described are all equally interesting. I think, and none of them are the right or wrong one, right? Like I've heard people say like, I just love the way it feels to use watercolor brushes on watercolor paper. There's a tactile thing that I really enjoy. That's legit. That's, that's a great reason, right? The, because we spend a lot of time with these tools. We might as well use them in a way that feels like pleasurable to use, right? Um, or it could be that th this, this gives me a certain line that only this tool will give me and that's why I use this tool, right? Or yeah, I don't have a whole lot of money to, sp to spend on uh, ridiculous arts. But I think Ryan Estrada, when he was on our show, there we go, we invoked his name. Um, <laughs> Ryan, Ryan was once said on, on our show, he's like, you know, like I, don't, I never know if I'm going to have access to whatever kind of art tool I fall in love with, so I try not to fall in love with any. I use whatever, right? He, he had comics that he drew in ballpoint pen on, you know, copy paper. Mm -hmm. So... Uh, yeah, I, it, I, the stories are, Joseph Coco is in the chat and he's saying, and I know Joseph has done this, uh, he interviewed me on his uh, video series for Natto Soup. Uh, I've interviewed a bunch of artists and most of them do have some type of story towards their process or even technical de decisions. Yeah, that's when you know you got a good interview, right? Is when there's actually a story there be, besides like, I don't know, just that's the way it is, that's all, it's drawing. So. It's, so I just, I don't know. The, I don't. I don't have enough perspective to even ask this question. But like, I wonder <laughs> if there is a. Um, it, clearly, we're coming from a similar cultural bias, sure. right? 
Yes. Uh, and and honestly, it's a giant stack of you know s sandwich ingredients, like huge cartoon size sandwich of things that we share in common. But yet, uh, I, all right. So where we have seen this not be the case, right? I've seen it not be not the case. Naming names. Be entertaining. And, I've seen I've okay. seen like speakers who, when they're asked, like you know, could you explain what the usefulness of your craft is? And like, there is no use for my craft. This is just something that I just do just because it's interesting to me, right? And it's like very, it, it seems almost dismissive, but it's very funny because it like, you expect some kind of like big top of the mountain zen-like answer to the question and like, no, it's not useful. <laughs> Who said this was useful, you know? Uh, yeah. But it's like, they're, they're still interested in it. So uh, and that can be very entertaining depending on the personality of the presenter, right? Um, yeah, and, and you know, I said at the top, like my bias is always going to be to like make it as inviting to everybody as, as I possibly can. Uh, I'm not saying that that's necessarily the recipe. I'm just saying. That and I'm clearly not saying that that's. I I agree with you 100. percent We can you know case closed, right? Yeah. Um, <laughs> but uh, <laughs> just try, you know, try just trying to consider that other angle, and maybe that's yeah. something that we can explore a bit more. Yeah. In, in the next section. Section. I don't want to yeah, outright dismiss it. Um, yeah. All right. So, yeah, that's, I think, a good enough signal to move on to 10,000 feet up, um, which we will do in just uh, about a minute and 30 seconds. But before we do that, uh, we have to thank some people who make the show possible, and those people are the folks who support us on Patreon. What is Patreon? Uh, well, it's a way for you to give us, like, a monthly upvote. A monthly way for you to say like hey i believe in the stuff that you guys do i believe in the way you think about things and i w i want you to have the resources to do more of it uh here's a dollar a month or whatever you can afford you go to patreon.com slash lean into art to do that and we want to take this opportunity to thank five people who have been doing exactly that first up becca hilburn i was just talking about joseph who is becca's partner on this endeavor which you can find out more about on twitter at natto soup n-a-t-t-o soup uh, also, Rachel Ross, longtime friend of the show. Rachel can be found on Twitter at NYC Terrace, T E R I S. NYC T E R S. Thank you, Rachel, for believing in us and the stuff that we do. Shane W. Smith, you can find on Twitter at, at Shane underscore W underscore Smith. Thank you, Shane. And Miriam. Miriam, we thank you for your support and believing in the work that we do. You can find Miriam on Twitter at M Y R J A M V D V. We'll link to all these in the show notes as well, so you don't have to remember the spelling offhand. Finally, Ashley Knapp, longtime friend of the show, has been on the show in the past. Uh, Ashley can be found on Twitter at Control Alt Lee. Your support means so a lot to a lot to us. And if you want to go to patreon.com slash lean into art, you can find all the shows that we produce, as well as our extra lean shows, uh, where Rob and I kind of just like, you know, riff off the cuff and uh, we post it only for patrons. You patrons are the only people who can get at it. And uh if you comment there, it becomes a private thread where you can interact with us and talk about whatever you want. It's like an open mic post, right, Rob? Yeah, that's right. And uh, we do that once a month on our Patreon at uh, patreon.com slash lean into art. Thank right. you very much for your support. Yeah, thanks, everybody. Uh, all right, here we go. Uh, how about... Keep on rolling. Going 10,000 feet up. Keep Does anything feel more 1985 than that? Oh. Uh, really it's it's right up there. Is that uh, <laughs> Jason the Wheeled Warriors or something? Jason the Wheeled Warriors. Yeah. Uh, really, really interesting cartoon. Um, I have a lot of thoughts on it, but we won't go into them here. Uh, <laughs> all right. Okay. 10,000 feet up. Questions to explore when on uh, presenting your material. So, like, okay, we talked about, like, like structures of how to how we think about presenting stuff. But what kind of questions do we ask ourselves in order to begin an investigation to unpack what we do to be able to make a presentation? So I think it really does help if you think about, well, who who's going to be here? And then why was I invited here? And if you can chunk that, those two different perspectives over a timeline, I think it gives you a bit of um, uh, a bit of a narrative to dive into. So you know that there's going to be a reason for um, someone to attend. What's what's sort of the the broadcasted signal of like, I want you to be curious. I want you to be here, and I want to you know share this time with with you in the audience. This is my 
this is my pitch for the for the thing. Maybe I can't come up with that right now because I'm actually going to have to think of later on the timeline. My um, maybe I'm thinking of, of the build up or the, the 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 crux of the whole talk or workshop, or maybe I'm just thinking about the outcomes and then I'm going to go back. But either way, I'm playing with time and saying you know beginning, middle, end. And then a couple of perspectives, like from someone attending and someone who is sponsoring. That perspective taking is such a big part of it for me. Um, and I think well, for both of us, I, we both do very service minded work. And um, both when I'm creating stories and when I'm talking about creating stories, I, th I try to really put myself in the place of what, what, does, what does my work look like to somebody who's never done it? Um, I remember when I was a little, little kid, this would be like third, fourth grade. Um, our local news station would do the weather report and they would cut to a cartoonist who was drawing, he was always drawing a duck and the duck would be experiencing whatever the weather report was going to be. And it's just like this quick little marker drawing. Now I haven't seen this, these cartoons in ages. So I don't know, I can't attest the quality of them now, but as a child, it was, it was like the best part of the news, right? Like probably <laughs> sounds like it. Tonight's news, problems, 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 problems. Oh, here's a guy drawing a duck in the rain, you know? <laughs> <laughs> when you're 10 or 9 what are you uh, going to be interested in right um but as i watched it i remember it looked absolutely magical how quickly those lines and because i maybe there was an underdrawing i couldn't see it but it looked like he was just throwing down random lines and then after about a minute there was a picture i was like how does he do it you know and i remember that that real feeling of electricity you know and and it, it, so having those kind of memories makes it easy to go back and say like, okay, what does it look like when I do this? Well, how do I make that magic trick go away? How do I lean into it? How do I play into that, that mystery? And then how do I slowly remove that? What's happening when that guy's doing that with the duck? How would I explain that to, to my nine year old self so that he could begin trying to do it? it that's um, let's see. So Though, so is that a bit of, so you got some personas in the perspective taking? So you're thinking of like... Walk us who, through what a pers who, persona is again, yeah. Per well, uh, a persona can take a lot of different shapes. Sometimes people use things that are like purely like demographic and stuff. You know, it's like, oh, you know, people of this, you know, this cultural background and this age range and what have you. But um, I tend to like things that are more behavioral and think about um, uh, needs and perspective like pain points and delights and and sort of group that as a personality and that those give me cons why, why I, I like to do that is is tangible constraints because someone who who has a particular income level I don't th what what's that telling me a constraint right um, I don't want or their income why are you telling me this right I don't care like maybe I care a little bit about where they live or, or their cultural background but um you know but it, it really has to show itself on the surface some observable evidence of of um so what do they do what does that look like what what might be a quote from them like this is a uh, um this is what they say when things are going really well like um it was it was so awesome that we we actually um we made a poster with the artist and the end um and or like it was uh, so I'd like to think of something tangible and like that that's something I can design toward if, and mm -hmm. like yeah. what about you in personas oh yeah I, I do this all the time with um, I mean now we can refer to another old episode uh, when we had Jesse Kaufman on talking about uh, the collaborative process we go through with the Captain Seriously comic and every year I make a new comic and every year I meet with school administration to talk about what are your students going through right now? What are the what are the problems that they're running into? What are the friction points they're running into? What kinds of uh, things do you, as school administration, as teachers, find it's difficult to address with the students? If you had help with one problem with your particular group of students, what would it be? That has nothing to do with like boy girl income status or any of that kind of stuff. It's more like what what are they? What, well, again, it's a behavior. What are they struggling with when they're uh, it's fantastic. So like you, you're, you're finding a way to group need in, in a persona and that that's super handy. And it's, and also intention based on, um, that's why I like to sort of bucket things based on the audience and also the sponsor. So this, the sponsor may have 
um, you know, their own desired outcomes? How do they, how do they see this as, um, this, this event, this system, this thing as, as a, um, a worthwhile endeavor. And I want to design toward them as well. Right. Yeah. So, so, so some of that might be like, well, we want to hear, um, we want to see like this level of participation among students. We want to see, um, other, I'm, I'm making basically building off of your example. Um, mm -hmm. and, uh, we, let's see, we would like to have, um, let's see a, I don't know, people, this many people sign a, sign a manifesto about, you know, being a committed community member or something like that. Right. And quantifying that a bit can help shape how you design the thing you design. Right. Um, and, and some of that perspective taking can happen through your own experience. Right. So like what, like a part of my exploration of these products, these books is, well, what was going through my head in ninth grade? What was I dealing with in ninth grade? Um, how can I dig into that to get like an authentic flavor for this, this particular story, but then also interviewing people, talking with people who are on the ground and dealing with, and, and if you can deal with, talk with kids directly, you know, something else that, that Jesse does with the seriously project is he actually gets kids of the age who are going to read this book to sort of be early draft readers of the outline and the thumbnails, to give me feedback on it. Um, that's huge. So, uh, I mean, in, in this case, I mean, that, 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 who knows? It's, it's often possible. Like you can have sort of people that, that, you know, match that audience but without actually having to do the event kind of thing. You can mm -hmm. do sort of a dry run, get react, get reactions that way and stuff. Oh yeah. Yeah. And, and my early teaching was exactly that was like, I was measuring how, when was I losing people? When were they staying involved? How was I, mm. when did they seem really excited about what was happening here? And when did they seem more adrift? and disinterested and knowing that this is all for the most part anecdotal data i can't you know some of it is um left to conjecture right because i don't know what's going on in this person's life maybe they left because they had an emergency maybe they left because they didn't feel well right uh but if you get those signals enough times you start to see patterns emerge and you can sort of address those things right and so my first workshops I ever led were very much like slide deck talk 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 for 20 minutes now everybody, I'm setting you loose, start making some stuff, and I'll come visit with you all individually, which was pretty good. But now, if you would see my classes, they are much more, oh my God, they're almost chaos, right? It's like, all right, we're doing a little <laughs> thing for five minutes. Everybody's shouting and screaming. All right, now I'm going to set a timer. Everybody has to draw something. You have 10 minutes to do it. And then it gets really quiet, and everybody's drawing really fa as fast as they can. A couple kids talk maybe while they're doing this, but really they're racing the clock. All right, we got the thing all done. All right, now everybody trade your things, pass them around. Everybody, and everybody pass their characters around. Now you're going to draw the opposite of that character. You're going to have 15 minutes to do it. Let's go. And everybody gets quiet again. You know. But then as kids are finishing, they're all sharing their work with one another. Here's the opposite I made of your character. It starts getting rambunctious. Again. All right, now we're going to do cool down. I'm going to bring out the board. We're going to draw some random shapes. We're going to turn them into things, right? So it's like always flying around the room, uh, which is exhausting. But I mean, I get to hear kids say to their parents they're leaving. This happened just the other day. It was so rewarding. Um, new kid, new new student. And the parents, as they they turn the corners, they're out of visual range. And I hear the parents say, like, oh, what'd you think? And the kid said, like, breathlessly, that was awesome. <laughs> <laughs> it's uh. like, ah, like when you know that, like, you made it, like, a kid really happy and they, they engaged with, with comics and they had that good of a time with it. It's like, that's the best. But anyway, um, but that was through years and years of refining things and learning that, okay, different age groups. So have, that's yeah. direct connection with an audience. And so yeah. like, there's no, this is a, this is an art and a science, right? You're, 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 um, you're learning as a practitioner, as you go, you're developing and changing probably because of how you question and critique your biases evolve. Like what you think is a quality work product will change over time. Uh, what you think is a good reaction from the audience will change over time. And that, I, I think that's incredibly valid. Like that, that is, um, I mean, that's your secret sauce. Like how, whatever defines your approach and style will be shaped by those experiences. And, and you was in the, the, everybody you listening right now. Yeah. You listening, you, yeah. And you Jersey and me, all, all, everyone, all of us. So if you choose to go about this endeavor of sharing what you know, and what you've learned so far and how, and, uh, the experience of doing that will be a feedback loop that changes how you do this. Um, 
down the road. Um, and then, I mean, you, you weave this stuff together. It's like, you're, you're trying to triangulate on like, what will be the right thing to do for this new talk, this new thing, this new workshop, what's coming up next, you know, will, um, what material has worked before? What sort of planning approach has worked before? What, you know, and, and then of course, what's new, like the, the, the interviews and the, and with the sponsors and the audience and all that, that's huge. That's like a, um, that's going to get you out of your, your own, you know, pre-existing things and assumptions. Like you will probably find out something that's an interesting nuance that now, now you have the chance to relate that new thing to what you already have experienced. And that'll add fresh energy to the, uh, to hopefully, you know, make it rewarding to create and then to sort of, then to perform. Agreed. Uh, do you want to hit a couple questions about like, cause now I'm, again, I'm, I'm taking perspectives and I'm thinking about, mm -hmm. okay, well, we talked a lot about technique and we talked about like some abstract stuff about like, like iterating and like self-interviewing and, and interviewing with stakeholders after going through this cycle a few times. But I'm, let's step back another step and say, okay, I'm about, I haven't even done this yet. I'm about to go approach somebody about doing some kind of presentation. Um, hmm, or maybe I sure. just got asked, um, what questions might we ask ourselves to begin um, the self-interview process to deconstruct and reverse engineer our work? Where, how do we start looking for interesting places to dig into our work to start to unpack it and, and then begin structuring it into the discrete activities, the magic tricks and the, and the personas and the service-oriented investigation? What kind of questions would you throw out? Um, so is this the case of, um, you've been invited to talk somewhere and then you just, but it's, you're really new to it. Yeah. You're new to or, it and you, okay. maybe you haven't spent a lot of time like trying to figure out <clears throat> why you're, what choices, well, how you arrived at all the conclusions that you've arrived at so far. Right. It's been, totally. it's, been, it's been intuitive up to this point. Well, and then the, the, there's another scenario that's not the invitation. Sometimes you throw your hat in the ring to say like, well, I have a proposal for a workshop. That's right. actually more common. Yep. So, um, but then, but then I just know that, um, just like getting involved in, in this, you know, creating comics or making video games or whatever you're making like that, I got pulled into that with this sort of desire and creative urge and, you know, following some kind of process like that. Now, all of a sudden I'm finding I want to take on this new endeavor and, and how do I, how do I do it? How do I, I think there's, it sounds like there's a couple of things that that's both, how do I think of a thing and then pitch the thing? <laughs> because maybe I don't have to create a whole talk. That's kind of nice. And, uh, I can just propose it. <laughs> so one exercise would be, let's say I have a goal of making like three different pitches of a talk that I think might be fun to share, but then I don't know what to put in the pitch. So long walk to try to model this thing that you've presented me here. So then, um, I must, I must have been stuck in what I've been working on at, in the past. And like, what, what, what was, are there any interesting stories in that? And like, what, are there any like insights that help me through uh, resources? Now I can share my experience and insights and resources that help me get through a thing. And now let's say that was, um, oh, returning back to physical media after a long time in the digital world, right? And this is the story of how I made, I, I, you know, I, I went into this um, mini comic creation, creation challenge before I really realized what I got myself into and, and now, okay, then I'll make a pitch for that. So I'll do a bunch of notes and then try to say like, um, that, that, that's funny. The, then the whole, the, the pitch is a whole different thing, but um, just to, to writing a description of this talk is one way to do it. Mm -hmm. Um, Here's the, here, so here's the idea for the talk. And I would, I would try to write a bunch of titles and write a couple seconds, se se sentence descriptions, maybe a small paragraph. 
and say, okay, do I like this? Tweak it, iterate, and then send it to the, uh, to the organizer. What I like about what I heard in there is there's um, identifying points when you had struggle. It's not only good narrative, right? Like struggle, characters, overcoming something is good narrative. But mm -hmm. also if people are coming to hear somebody talk about something, odds are they have had some kind of passing interaction with the thing and have encountered some frictions of their own. So you also get the, we just got a comment in one of our videos from a past episode where somebody was saying like, hey, that part where you guys talked about how hard that was really meant a lot to me because I have a hard time with that too. And it wasn't that we presented a solution. It was just that we were saying like, this part really sucks and it's really hard. And it's just sometimes it's good for people to hear that. But also then there's baked in, like here's strategies that helped me through it. And I'm betting also on the other side of that is, and here's how my perspective shifted after going through that cycle and going through that. But you're also then modeling for an audience that this is something with genuine hurdles that do suck. But when you overcome them, there's new insights to be gained, right? Yeah, that's uh, that that's um, you know kind of a rough draft how I how I would go about it starting and how I it's not that different to what I do now <laughs> coming up with a new uh, new workshop. But there's something there's something really inclusive in that too that is not saying like all right. So you want to be, you want to be a comic superstar. You want to be the next, the next top developer on the app, uh, Apple App Store, right? Here's what you do, kid, right? And I've been to those talks. I've been, to, I've been to talks that, and I've been to talks even by like less experienced presenters who seem to subscribe to that method of like, well, this is what you do to be a professional presenter, and to which. I, I just it, it just doesn't feel like there's a, a real richness to that other than here is a recipe. If you put it here, lots of people see it, you get lots of likes, that's a good thing. Well, why is that a good thing? And why would you choose that platform over this platform? You know, well, this is the one where there's a lot of people. Well, there's a lot of people over here too, right? And so now it turns into like me like investigating them to get the real answer out of it, right? Rather than them, I'm not interested in, in the, uh, the recipe, I'm interested in the journey to get me to frame up my thinking so I can begin to approach this thing a little bit more um, attentively and, and uh, intentionally. Right. Mm -hmm. um, Your bias is showing again. It's essentially, it's all about handing out tools that other people may apply for their own, their own needs in their own way to achieve their own outcomes. I, I, I will say just, not, I'm, and this isn't me pushing back, but this is just me sort of like accepting the bias ball. <laughs> mm -hmm passed it to me it's like people showing up to this show are probably well accustomed to our bias and have accepted it as like part of the part of the package True. um i don't think anybody's going to be calling me out on that one necessarily but um but okay so here's another one leaning into that a little bit harder um a simple one is like and this is a question that when i go to panels and people are going to do q a i love this question to throw out there because i, I think it's a genuinely fascinating idea is um What's, what's one quote unquote rule that you always uh, adhere to in your work and, well, and why, but then follow up question, can you tell me about some times when you had to break it, right? Hmm. Because that rule to me is like sort of, it frames up a lot of your beliefs about what the ideal state of the work is in, in, a, in a general sense. Um, even though you would never necessarily like push that on anybody else, unless you're a monster, in my opinion. Uh, but uh, but then even even the hardest of rules have situations where you had to break it. And I think that's an interesting idea to explore too. Is why would you have to break that rule ever, right? Um, mm -hmm. Like for instance, something that I I pay a lot of close attention to is like I really get uncomfortable if I end a comics page where the action or composition isn't moving our eye. To the right right I'm always trying to move us into the next page and if I ever catch myself not doing it uh, I either correct it and if I correct it and it's wrong I'm like oh this might be a situation where I have to break the rule why did I have to break the rule that time right yeah that, that's a that's a really interesting one and, and a, a mechanism to to yeah to dig through your own your own experience for because you could ask yourself like do I have rules yeah and 
I guess uh, if I look at my work, now I'm looking at my work with this certain lens and I might see a rule emerge. Uh, and, and I could say, well, is that a rule? And how's that? Yeah, uh, that's a really handy, uh, handy framework. Right. I don't have this written out in a manifesto on my wall. It's just I have like certain, certain behaviors that like add up to, well, generally speaking, I never do this particular thing, right? I, like if I catch myself doing it, I almost always correct it. So like that's some kind of internal rule on me. Um, hmm. And I, I just had a discussion with my students today about this whole idea of like writing flaws and characters and trying to like re renegotiate the term flaw to take it away from weakness into a predilection. And then I was pointing out how like you can have characters whose predilections can be beneficial, but then in other situations be a flaw. And I was talking about like Hermione and Ron Weasley. Like, well, what's Hermione's? Uh, flaw. Oh, she's really uptight about her grades. I'm like, well, isn't that ever, is that sometimes a benefit? I'm like, oh yeah, well, it's a benefit because she has a lot of knowledge to solve problems. Yeah. Is it ever a hindrance? Well, because she can push her friends away because she's so rigid and so strict. Okay. Right. Like that flaw is on a spectrum, right? It's like mm -hmm. more like a, an idiosyncrasy rather than necessarily a flaw, but like that's what's the lovable characteristic of the character. Right? Um, yeah. I mean, and so some of these things like they're the shorthand can get us, um, I, it's easy to get uh, thrown off by some shorthand yeah. where all of a sudden you're, you're looking at a word and, and not agreeing with it. Yeah. And that's yeah. a, yeah, that's so interesting. The, um, okay. So that's why I put rule in air quotes and I, and I, and it's because I've had this discussion with artists in the past where they're like, I don't have any rules. I'm like, well, let me, <laughs> let me back up. Let me find another way of saying it. But the, which, which that's a really good point. So like, again, you know, if you're, it's the, um, I mean, you've talked about this for years, but having the, essentially this, this critical eye, when you're, when you're, you're minding your own business, enjoying a movie and suddenly something jumps out, maybe feels like it bites you. And all of a sudden it's time to, it, it's a chance. You don't have to take this opportunity, but you could, you could now start digging into that. And so if even any of these prompts is frustrating in some way, why? Okay. It's, it's, it's a, it's a place to, to begin a, a, an intentional investigation and through that investigation, um, unbox, it's like you're decoding and then in a way that you can help. So other people could encode it, right? It's like, you're trying to, you're just trying to share some stuff. How can people consume it? They've got to be able to, you know, if, if you're putting it in some format, that's not, that doesn't make sense as an experience or as a narrative or as, um, as jargon, then, then maybe there's more work to do, but. Okay. I've got two more that I want to hit before we maybe get okay. to final thoughts. Maybe one of them will be final thoughts. I think that's a big one. Mm. Um, this show itself, the format and structure of this show, I feel like is, um, a case in point of the presentation, right? Because you could take either half of the show and just treat that as its own separate presentation, right? Mm -hmm. We like to do both because we think that, well, maybe we don't. Let me ask you, do we think that those things feed into each other? My guess is yes. That, like doing the, the practical <laughs> exploration, here's us doing it, here's us thinking about it. Right? I'm glad you finally asked this. This has been weighing on me. <laughs> <laughs> uh, no, dun dun dun. <laughs> Turns out, I totally agree with the format of our show. And, <laughs> and the to it really, it there's a lot to to um to the the sort of energy between theory and practice, or right. hands on and reflection, all that. It's it it's a way to get f more immersed in anything. But what's funny is I was having discussions about this very topic with some other creators in my life asking, you know, what do you think? And they were kind of, they were coming at it from the standpoint of, um, well, why do you have to have the 10,000 feet up section? Why don't you just have the on the ground section? Why can't that be the whole thing? And I was like, good point. You could, if that's what you want to do, that is totally valid and legit to just show the nuts and bolts. Here's how I do it. You draw your own conclusions about a lot of the rationale maybe that's not for me to decide maybe it's for you to decide what the rationale is right maybe i'm making it more inviting by inviting you to develop your own rationale as to why you arrive at those choices fine 
or if you want to talk about it purely in theoretical terms, more academics. Sure. Um, I like I like uh, I like fri- French fries with my burger. <laughs> does that does that metaphor even work? I, it totally does. I, I mean, it's it's not. Um, and and what's what's funny is this format isn't isn't a uh, shackled thing that that we have. I mean, we hack it all the time, yeah. but um, because we can continue to revisit and reinterpret what you know, which which section is is more important to emphasize this time around because we feel that you know, it this topic is more of a hands on thing or what have you, um, it, or the other opposite. And even how we interpret, sometimes it's hard to um, separate. And, and either way, it's a mechanism that pulls us through the experience of sharing what we've experienced or learned or um, just would like to dig into. What's funny is this format generates stuff. Yeah. So we don't even know what's going to come out necessarily until it's it's a more of a, um, it's a, it, it's a way to, um, explore and discover and in addition to present and then to be a little bit meta on this and back up and look at what we just did that's also what you, I'm doing in my classroom experiences I, I'll ask myself okay what's one tiny thing I want the kids to play with today I want them to play with moment choice well what if I had them capture a scene and I do a little bit of presentation on moment choice, but I have them capture a scene where I write out some, you know, there's actually a workshop that I did called Sequences and Consequences, this very idea, and watch how they interact with it. And build, iterate after those, the, we go through those cycles together and after the conversations that we have based on that, right? When we just mm-hmm. lay out six index cards, they draw the scene as they see it in their head, then we rearrange the scene to find an equally valid of information and how does that change how it feels and it was all based on like how can i efficiently get them to produce two different stories well if they only draw it once and rearrange it they'll get two different stories and then they get like that double um feedback loop positive feedback loop of wow i created two different books and i only had to draw it once right Mm. so yeah like the, the simple act of organizing the information and coming up with a discrete activity with a discrete goal will generate more material for follow up presentations and workshops and so on, right? As yeah, as it does. I mean, so the the format when you execute it, I mean that's it, it, it acts as this this um design constraint that we have a conversation with. And um, you know, things emerge. And what what will emerge as our uh, final question? Do you think? <laughs> well, I've got one that I want to throw out at you and see. Let's see if you think it's interesting enough. Is I'm I'm perfectly ready to accept a completely different one. Okay. Mm-hmm. But um, I want to think about. I think buried in a lot of our discussion here is you and I both have um, principles behind our work that we've either unearthed through this unpacking or maybe have revealed themselves through doing this stuff over and over again. Um, are, what's the role of these principles, if they're even necessary? Right? Um, what, do, what, do, what, what function do these principles serve? Or are they a construct that we sort of... Did the math already exist or did we name... Or did we just like come up with names? Or did we came up with names for something that already existed or did we invent... A system for describing something right i guess that's what i'm trying to get at when i talk about these principles behind our work okay cool I, no i like that and like are they are they necessary are they um do you know why why make them concrete like does does making them so explicit is that really important i mean you had them already so what yeah okay all right well, that's what that's where we'll close out with in about a minute and forty five seconds, maybe two minutes. In case you're actually hitting that thirty second button on your pod player, uh, but uh, I invite you to not do that because we're going to talk about some interesting stuff coming up. We're going to thank some more people who make the show possible. Those people happen to be us. I'm going to play a game in a second. You're going to watch me play a game if you're watching the video. Uh, so mm-hmm. here we go. The things that we make. Uh, the first up is uh, the comic that I made called Boulder and Fleet at boulderandfleet.com. Um, here's I found a page with those inset panels I was describing earlier, right? 
Oh, cool. Um, very Voltroni. Very Voltroni. What is Boulder Fleet? It's about a, two best friends, a bear and a bird, who decide to go into business as adventurers for hire, which means they're going to have adventures. It means they're going to bump into things like dragons and monsters and so on, um, which is cool, except for the fact that the bear doesn't like to actually hurt anybody. The bear is, um, is very gentle. Even though he's very powerful, he's very gentle. Well, why is that a problem? Well, because the bird is a very ambitious bird, and she wants to be the most successful adventurer of all time. So she's pushing this poor, sweet, gentle bear into all these dangerous situations, and he pushes back with his gentleness, and they find some kind of middle-of-the-road solution to these problems. Uh, you can read it online for free at boulderandfleet.com, on Instagram, at boulderandfleet. I'm about to drop some new books in the store, um, so you'll want to check the Boulder and Fleet's uh, website. There's a link in the sidebar to the to the store where I sell my mini comics, uh, the new story that I got on the screen right here, um, a friendly game is in print now. I'm about to put them up for sale. So, uh, boulderfleet.com. Rob, you make a game. Let me pull up the game while we talk about the game. All right. Yeah, Boulder and Fleet is awesome. It's it's really exciting that that you have a new book. But of course, the existing Pickles and Taft and Captain Cat and Boulder, the existing Boulder and Fleet book, super worth picking up. Um, beautiful work. Kind of you to say. So tell and, me about this game that I'm about to hit the play button on. Well, hit it. There sounds goes good. There you are. You're playing this game called This Panda Needs You. And well, why does a panda needs you need you? It's because this panda keeps encountering this in some shapes and, and they're like physics puzzles. And um, hey, no big deal. They're all stacked up. They look fine until a cloud comes along and knocks them all down. And so it's your job to help the panda put it back together. Panda celebrates and walks on and encounters a new puzzle. And there's like over 50 levels. They start out very approachable and, and simple and get more and more challenging as you go. Uh, it's really meant to be an all ages game, but it's certainly, um, it, it's the design was m initially targeting a very young audience, you know, learning like pattern recognition and um, sort of cause and effect with uh, this playing with physics. And you can learn more about it at this this panda.com. It's available for iPhone, iPad, uh, Android phones and tablets, and also your uh, Mac OS desktop and Windows as well. So Windows and Mac are at itch.io. And of course, your you know um, iPhone or your your Apple-based devices are going to be in the iOS App Store, and your your uh, Android-based devices will be in the Google Play Store. So check this out. I, I try to stack the thing. If I put it too close to the edge, yeah. whoop bonk. <laughs> so there's like there's like real physics in this game. That's really cool. Yeah. And it's... as you, as you get closer to getting it right, watch what the panda does. Like. Oh, you're doing it. You're doing it. <laughs> the panda goes, yay. And then you get it. Stars are burst out of the, uh, the, the construction that you made, and the, the panda dances. So happy. All right. Well, supposing that, okay, that's all very well and good. You guys make games and comics. Good for you. Uh, but we're really here because we like the way you guys think about stuff, and that's fair enough. Um, so we have products like that too. That's at leanintoart.com slash workshops where you can find video workshops uh, concerning stuff that we teach. This whole episode has been about the stuff we teach. Well, you can actually download a video and experience one of our classroom experiences uh, yourself at a price of your choosing. Uh, you could choose free if you want, but if you get something out of it, the cool thing you could do would be go, go back and purchase it and it's like giving us a tip for uh, the thing that we made. And uh, if you've done that too, a great thing you can do right now that costs you nothing but a few seconds of your time is giving the video a thumbs up, subscribing to the channel on YouTube. It helps more people find the show. And if you listen to it in a podcatcher like iTunes, uh, giving the show a five-star rating in iTunes, maybe even writing a review, that helps more people find the show as well. And we appreciate uh, everybody who has been interacting with our stuff in those ways. It means a lot to us. It really does. Thank you. And All like right. And subscribe, as the, as the folks say. So we've, we've got a question. You dropped a question on our lap. Mm -hmm. We need to think about um, so principles and and are the, like do they really serve us in in trying to tackle this kind of thing? Unpacking your work for pre presenting or or doing a workshop, like how the heck? Uh, so what do you mean by principles? And then um, what kind of a, what kind of effect do you think they have, Jersey? Oh man, well I mean like we can back out and talk about principles in a general sense. Principles principles help guide you when you're facing 
difficult situations uh, where you aren't sure where your stance is on something or what the right choice is to make. You know, referring to one's principles becomes a, a great way to. It's it's a, a design constraint. <laughs> uh, You're a kid, man. Yeah, in, in a yeah. really serious way. We, we've talked about the the Stenzinger coat of arms. That's that's a set of principles in a, in a very like more broad sense, right? Um, but as I mm -hmm. as I unpack my classroom experience or my, my work for use in classrooms and in presentations, I realize that I'm often talking about what my principles are as well. It's like because in exploring why I do something, I notice that patterns emerge. Right? There's a certain kind of aesthetic, there's a certain kind of point, there's a certain kind of approach that I really uh, adhere to. Um, and and we've made uh, a lot of points about our biases at the top of this one and throughout. Um, I make things to be of service to somebody. Like I'm, I'm often thinking about how people will interact with the thing that I make. So when I hear authors say like, well, I just made something for me. It's like, wow, I have a really hard time getting to that. You know, like as I'm working on my stories, I'm like, I want to make something just for me. Um, it's really, that's not a space that I operate fluently in right now. Um, so yeah, principles emerge. Um, mm. And I wind up talking about them a lot. But I've also noticed that in recent years, um, I'm starting to get confused about what they really are after all. They're starting to get vague again. They're starting to get like fuzzy um, because every time I start saying a definitive statement about anything to do with my work, I think of a dozen situations where that wouldn't necessarily be true. Hmm. So is it a principle then? <laughs> that's, it's a, yeah. Yeah. I mean, that's, that's a big topic. So maybe... It may be a, um, something has changed that that the utility of what was once such a clear principle, um, it's out of context. It doesn't, maybe it's no longer as, um, maybe you relate to it differently now, maybe um, who you're serving or how, so, I mean, something's different. And and um, so like I can think of um, so, like the feeling of, hmm, thinking of like gamifying things using gameful des design and how I've like, that's an example of, of something that I've, how I engage with that has changed over the years. It hasn't like gone away. It's, it's present when I'm, when I'm creating an experience pretty much no matter what, because I find that some kind of tight feedback loops for um, an interactive experience can create this sort of, um, self-teaching mechanism where where essentially a a user is having a dialogue in a way that's implied with what they're consuming what they're spending their time with and what they interact with and every single bit of energy they put into it can be um channeled toward communicating about what they could expect next or to reward that choice or interaction and and i and i've but how i i feel like i had a clearer picture of of like my relationship with that at one time than than I do now, so I, I kind of get with with you know what you're um, what you're describing, but I still wouldn't sort of throw out principles as in there's typically some big motivating factor for you, right? And if you can if you can cr describe that in a way that it just it acts like a signpost of like, well, I want this to be a let's see, not just a goal or some attribute or feature of, of a talk or a workshop, but like, let's see, I guess a principle would be something that you could really say, I believe in this yeah. in a way you could say, it's a very strong hypothesis that you're, you're saying this gets to influence the, the, the project because of how I feel about it. And I can rationalize plenty how I feel about it. And maybe it upholds to plenty of different scrutiny, or maybe it doesn't. Either way, you've nominated. You, you said like, I'm going to refer to this as a sign point, uh, 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 and it's going to help me find my way through this project. Um, it's a reference. And to speak to my bias again, like I react very warmly and positively to anybody who can make that statement, even if I disagree with it. Um, I was at CXC and I saw a lot of different cartoonists talk and I heard some cartoonists say things where, where I was like, no way, you know, that is pure D wrong. 
<laughs> and but I would but I admired the heck out of them for being able to speak to it so clearly. I disagreed with them a hundred percent, but I'm not going to take that away from them by any means because they have very strong feelings about it and they stood in front of it. Right. Um, I got a lot of respect for people who can do that. Yeah, and it's funny, I I, I totally respect it too because it's it's a it's helpful for me to stumble into things I really disagree with in such a clear way and then look back and, and ask why because um, like if someone said well why would you make something in a service oriented way like it, this is a, this is about you and this is about um, you're hitting see. that what I was disagreeing with <laughs> <laughs> well all I'm doing is picking something I know oh. I know I disagree with right where it's inherently I believe in honoring everyone's time yeah. Their, their time and attention is a resource that um, is, it, it, it is scarce. And I, th I think it is a kindness and something to appreciate when someone chooses to share that with me. And I wish to m somehow define the, the thing that I'm making in a way that, that lives up to honoring that or or me conveying that i believe in honoring that that exchange the time and attention so there you go you can speak to it yeah you have the principle you've thought it through and you can speak to it and you can speak to it with a sense of passion and clarity so hmm. i think that's i think that's a really great way to like round off and end on this thing is like that's that's something that feeds into all the other level elements that we kind of spoke to today that's that is awesome. That was a hard one to walk around. <laughs> <laughs> but see, there's that fluency thing again because it looked really easy from where I was standing, like watching you think it through. So Oh, that's great. <laughs> <laughs> I'm All, right. To hear I think that. All right. Did show. I think we did a podcast. Um we did. So thank you for this discussion, Rob. And uh we'll be back. We record the show every week, Thursday nights at ten PM Eastern time, uh nine PM Central. I forget what that is in UTC. One of these days I'm going to remember that. But anyway, it's on YouTube and then it's ar uh, archived as an audio and video podcast at patreon.com slash lean into art. We thank everybody who has been um, interacting with the show, showing up for the live streams and talking about it uh, with their friends and posting about it online. It means a lot to us. So until it's next time. amazing. Thank you. Yeah, until next time, everybody, I've been Jersey Drozd of leanintoart.com and Jersey Drozd on Instagram. And I've been Rob Stenzinger of leanintoart.com, also Rob Stenzinger on Instagram. Okay, bye. Show notes for this episode can be found at leanintoart.com. You can also follow us on Twitter at the user leanintoart, and you can reach us via email at leanintoart at gmail.com. And remember, leaners aren't wieners. Thanks for listening. Okay, I'm going to kill the stream. Thanks, everybody, for hanging out with us. Yeah, thanks for hanging out.